and gentlemen, this is an announcement from Planet X31. Please take your seats. scientific lectures and music art performances combined with high class dry ice cocktails. It's aim is to spread knowledge and have a good time while doing it. <laughs> First teleportation of science and cocktails autumn season will be guided by Ole Morrison. Professor of Biophysics at the University of Southern Denmark. He will talk about umami. 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 In particular, he will explain the sensation of taste in the palatus, in the tongue, and in the lips. More precisely, He will explain why the molecular mechanism behind the sensation of mommy is responsible for the deliciousness taste of certain foodstuff. And our transmission. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give a big applause to all the Moritz. Clap, 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 clap. <laughs> Thank you very much. I don't think I've ever had such an introduction before. <laughs> so I'm truly impressed. It's great to see so many people here who possibly are excited about what I'm going to tell you about, something very basic to all of us, that is taste. And it's a great privilege to come here to speak to you as a scientist and also an amateur chef to speak about something that I'm passionately interested in, and that is taste. So let me start out by testing your taste. So, look at these four petri dishes, and we are in the realm of science, so I can say petri dishes. And if you think about the basic taste you have on your, in your mouth and your tongue, and we look at the, the, the red currant here and some sour cream, and you think of a basic taste, what would you say? Sour. Sour, yes. And up here we have a, a, a melon in honey. Sweet, there's nothing to discuss. And down here we have a fresh oyster and some Sea asparagus, or saltwort in Danish, what would you say? Saldi. And on the other side here we have some um, um, walnuts in radicial lettuce. Bitter. Um, we could possibly discuss it a bit more, but I don't think there's any reason to discuss it more. We have the four classical basic taste, sweet, salty, sour, and bitter. Now I'm going to tell you about the fifth one, and this is my, my story. Um, and um, while we ponder about what the fifth one could be, um, then look at these, um, this panel with these nine different types of food. We have um, sun-ripe tomatoes, we have a blue cheese, we have some sea seaweed here, some fresh fish, uh, cured ham, green asparagus, shiitake mushrooms, a wonderful parmesan cheese, and some oysters here. And um, we could probably discuss the, rush, the rest of the evening. What does this taste we have different perceptions of the taste, and we take the, 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 uh, the cheese, maybe you'll say it's a little bit bitter, maybe you'll say it's salty. And what about the other ones? What, do we, what would you say about the tomatoes? You may say they're sweet, uh, they taste like sun, some may say. 
we can discuss, discuss the rest of the afternoon or the rest of the evening. So, but there is actually an underlying fundamental taste under all these nine, as well as a lot of other stuff we really like. In order to get deeper into that, we'll ask a scientist, and here's a scientist, one of my heroes. It's a Professor Kinu, Kinune Ikeda, and he's, he's Japanese. And um, he studied in Europe around the turn of the last turn century, um, and he started with a very famous German physical chemist called Ostwald. And Ostwald was the founder of modern physical chemistry, that is the kind of chemistry that study chemical compounds, chemical processes, it could also be foodstuff, using physical techniques. And Ikeda learned all about all these techniques and he went back to Tokyo, he was at the Imperial um, um, University in Tokyo, and he set himself to find out what is it in the Japanese soups that make these soup taste umai? And the Japanese term umai means something like delicious. And I'm sure you all have had miso soup, and some of you may know that miso soup is based on a soup broth, which is called dashi. And you'll hear the word dashi many times as we come along. So in order to make miso soup, you have to have this soup broth. I'm going to tell you how you, you make it and then you toss in some miso, and you may also have some uh, sea seaweed, and then maybe some fish and shellfish, and that's your, that's your soup, and here's the clear soup, and here's the miso soup. So the question is, what is it in this soup that makes it taste umai? And um, the recipe for making dashi is uh, basically taking two very weird ingredients. You're taking some seaweed, brown seaweed, and taking a very weird fish product. And you may think these things are weird, they are pretty weird, and I'll tell you what they are. And then a little later, I'll point out things in your cuisine that gives a similar kind of flavors. So um, let's take the brown seaweed first. And it's called kanbu, or sagrina japonica. And I have a piece of it out here, and it's actually folded four times. So you can imagine how big it is. It's in the same family as our sugar kelp. It doesn't take taste um, sweet. But those of you who are, are very close can see that there's some white stuff sitting on the outside, and you think he's probably brought some dirty seaweed. But actually, this is where the taste is, and this is what Ikeda found out. This particular stuff that sits here outside on the seaweed, as well as inside the seaweed, it seeps out in water when you put it in cold water, raise the temperature, and uh, let it sit there for a while and then you take the seaweed off, and then you have what is called a konbu dashi. It's a dashi just made with the extract of the seaweed. And if you taste this, and those of you who want to taste the seaweed, you can come up here afterwards to get a little piece in your mouth. You can taste it, it has a delicious flavor. Now that's the beginning of the soup. Um, you're taking the seaweed out, and then you add this other weird product. And it's actually a fish, and I have the fish up here. And it's called katsubushi. And um, it used to be three times as big. It comes from a fish in the mackerel family. It's called bonito. And it's five times over conserved. It's cooked, and it's salted, it's dried, it's fermented, and it's smoked. And this takes <laughs> about three months. And after this process, it's like a piece of hard wood. And it's basically unedible as it is. Um, and again, come up and taste it. Smell it afterwards. It has a beautiful smoky taste. And in order to put that in the soup, you have to shave it. So you take a particular kind of, of um, um, a shaver, and you can make it in very fine flakes. And these flakes, it comes like this. Uh, and you put them in the soup. And um, the shaving, these flakes are only a hundred of a millimeter thick. They're so thin that what seeps out of this fish comes out 98%. I'm going to tell you what it actually is. So you put these flakes in the soup, bring it up to boiling, strain everything off, and then you have the dashi. And dashi is much more than a soup broth. It's actually the center of the whole Japanese cuisine. You put vegetables in, you make various kinds of soups, you may broil fish, um, it's, so it's much more than a soup stock. So what Ikeda did 
or a Japanese chemist, he started analyzing what's in the seaweed, and then he found out that there is a salt, a sodium salt of the most common amino acid. Uh, and amino acids, as you know, uh, they're part of the proteins, and some are essential and some are not essential. This particular amino acid called glutamic acid, you have it both in plants, you have it in animals, you have it in algae, and seaweed is an algae. And in this particular algae, this brown seaweed, it's in very high amounts. It's about 3%. And I found no other foodstuff in nature that contains so much of this glutamic acid in the form of a salt, and it's called monosodium glutamate, or MSG. And here uh, it is in pure form. I brought some, you're welcome to taste it. It's uh, completely harmless. It's just as dangerous as kitchen salt. And um, what Ikeda then said, he tasted it, and he said, this is what makes the soup delicious. This is the source of umai. And he wrote a little paper about in 1909. And I'll come back to this paper a couple of times because I'll get also convey some science history to you, sort of the weird ways of science as, as, it, as they go. And this particular paper was written in Japanese. It was not translated until two, it, was, uh, it was published in 1909, but it was not published until 2002. And that's because what he claimed in this paper, the Western scientists didn't believe, because he said glutamate provides for a new basic taste. So along with four ones I told you about, there's a fifth one. And let me read for you from this paper, and you can read it here in Japanese. And um, he says here, there's still another quality, which is quite distinct from all these, and that means sweet, sour, bitter, and briny, which is salty, and which must be considered primary, that is a basic taste, because it cannot be produced by any combination of the other qualities. It's usually so faint and overshadowed by other stronger tastes that it's often difficult to recognize it unless the attention is specifically directed toward it. For this taste quality, the name glutamic taste or umami, umami is proposed. And so he said, this is such a wonderful taste and it's basic, we cannot just call it umai because there's so many umai things, there's so many delicious things. This is the most delicious. Of the, of the of, of delicious taste. So he, con he brought two Japanese words together, umai, with mi, which is, means the center of taste. So umami is a construction. And he said, I'm going to use this word for the time being until a better word has been found. And it never happens. And that's why we have it with us. And uh, let me read uh, one more thing here from his, his paper from 1909. I think it's a wonderful statement. He said, had we had had we nothing sweeter than carrots or milk, our idea of the quality sweet would be just as indistinct as it is the case with this particular quality. That is, I say, if you didn't have anything like sugar in your kitchen, you only have carrots and milk, you may not have invented sweet. Just as honey and sugar gave us so clear a notion of what sweet is, the salt of glutamic acid are designed to give us an equally def definite idea of this particular taste quality. So what he says is, glutamate is for umami, what kitchen salt is for salt. We even use the same word. I don't know if you noticed that, we use the same word. But there's so many other things that sodium chloride that provides saltiness. You could also say, glutamate is for umami, what sugar is for sweet. Even though there are many other things that are sweet. Now, you may, have, you may be thinking, what about the fish? What's in the fish? And I have to tell you a little bit uh, chemistry because I have to introduce some words. And don't panic of these uh, formulas and these uh, uh, structures. Um, I spoke about proteins, and proteins are composed of nucleic acids. Proteins have no taste unless they cut into small pieces, for instance, by enzymes or by cooking. These small pieces can be the smallest ones, called, um, 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 amino acids. They provide taste. And if there are a few amino acids bound together, we call them peptides. Some of these peptides also have taste and flavor, and it's very distinct, for instance, in, in garlic. Um, so glutamate provides uh, fumami as long as it is in free form, that is, as a, as a salt. There's another amino acid, aspartic acid, with a salt that's called aspartate. It also has a faint umami taste, and I'll come back to that. But mostly think of glutamate providing for umami. 
Now, what about the fish? So in order to understand what's in the fish, I have to introduce nucleic acids. And usually when we talk about food stuff and, and um, nutrition, we don't talk about nucleic acids. Of course, we talk about nucleic acids when we talk about genes and heredity. Um, but, um, so you can look at the label of something you buy in the supermarket and it says how many calories there, how much sugar, how much fat, how much protein. You never say how much nucleic acid that is in there. And, and the reason for that is that it doesn't have much nutritional value, but it has taste. If the nucleic acids are broken down in their constituents, and these constituents are called nucleotides. So that's basically the chemistry you need to understand. There are different kinds of nucleotides that can elicit umami, and I'm going to mention three, and you hear these words over and over again, so bear with me. Inosinate, guanolate, adenolate. Inosinate we'll find in fish and meat. Guanolate we'll find in something like mushrooms, fungi, and adenolate we'll find in shellfish, but also in tomatoes, and I'll come back to tomatoes in a little while. So what's in the fish? And that was actually discovered by one of um, uh, Ikeda's uh, students, um, Kodama, Kodama, and he found out that in this uh, fish, this strange fish, this hard fish, in flakes, um, there is large amounts of inosinate. And inosinate was already known at that time because there was a German chemist von Liebig who actually extracted it from meat. And he made some of the first products that we now have been using for soup stock. You know, you have a powder or a little cube, uh, and it, it's made from, from, uh, from meat. It contains a lot of inosinate. So that's the secret behind, behind the fish. Now, uh, I'm sure many of you don't eat fish, and you don't eat meat either. And uh, there are also other people who don't do that. And um, what do you then do in order to make dashi? So we asked the Japanese monks, the Zen Buddhists, uh, we're not supposed to eat uh, animals, so what do they do? And they figured out you can replace the fish by a fungus. And one uh, that has, has particularly good for that is shiitake mushrooms, dried shiitake mushrooms. And this um, was discovered in 1957 that these shiitake mushrooms are very high in one of the other nucleotides, the one I call guanolate. And it was discovered by Kuninaka. And, but he not only discovered that, he also discovered something which is the secret of umami. And this is what I'm going to tell you about now. And that is that small amounts of one of these nucleotides together with glutamate can enhance the flavor so it gets hundredfold, maybe thousandfold more powerful. This is what we call synergy. And um, when, we, when I come a little later in my talk, I'll remind you that all of you who cook know how you use that in the kitchen. You may not just think of it as synergy, but if you make a brown gravy, which the Danes like, you know you have to add sometimes a little bit of blue cheese. And that has to do with the synergy, and I'll come back to that. So there's lots of guanolate in, um, in these um, mushrooms. So now I'm going to tell you how it works. So this is, this is the secret behind umami. So um, we talk about taste, and taste is the sensation or part of taste, and you may know that taste is much more than what is happening in the tongue and the palate. It also has to do with the olfactory sense, it has to do with the hearing, it has to do with your vision, it has to do with uh, the mechanics in the mouth. I'm talking only about the, t the taste which is happening on the taste buds. Well, we know that taste is much more complex, but just look at the taste buds. So here we have the tongue. And, um, uh, there's, we have about 9,000 taste buds on our tongue. And the taste buds are like sort of a little cluster, um, uh, like an onion, or I really think it's more like a kind of an orange. And um, these different parts that provide for the sections of the orange, they're neural cells, particular kind of nerve cells that are called taste cells. And the taste cells are hardwired into the brain. So this is sort of the nerve signal will go here. So if there's some sensation here that provides a stimulus, it will be transferred to the brain, in this case to the sensory center in the brain where, 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 where taste is, is localized. And as, um, neural cells, they're packed like this, and, um, and, and they're sort of little opening, a pore. And in order to taste something, the taste substances has to be dissolved in your saliva, 
it has to be in a watery substance, then it gets down the pore, and then it may meet uh, these cells, and all cells are bounded by what is called a membrane, a biological membrane, and is in this membrane is all the machinery of the cell. And part of this machinery is what we call the receptors. They're agents, big molecules, proteins, that can receive signals from the outside and pass them into the cell and propagate them through the cell. And of course, there's also a stimulus that goes the other way. And the particular sensors, receptors, that the illicit taste we call taste receptors. And we now know taste receptors for sweet, sour, salt, bitter, and the taste receptor that I actually come now Umami was discovered in 2000 and 2002. And going back to what I said, the science history about not getting a Japanese paper translated until 2002, it happened to be translated the year when the receptors was found because now people started believing that umami is a basic taste, it's the fifth taste. So let's see how it works. So. Um, a receptor is, as I said, a big protein. It spans the membrane. This is the border between the outside. This is where the taste substances come in. And then there's some signaling going on, and it's a very complicated process that eventually will lead to signaling into the brain. It says, mommy. But look at the part that sits out here. It's like sort of a, a what we call a Venus flytrap. It's like a hinge, like this. It's like an antenna. And this is where the substances are bound. And I've indicated here there are two different substances that can bind. One of them is, of course, glutamate, and the other one is one of these nucleotides. So this, this could be what comes from the seaweed. This could be what comes from, from um, either fungus, the shiitake mushrooms, or from the, uh, this strange fish. You may also notice I've drawn two different parts here, and it's in this part the umami sensation happens. And a little later, I'm going to show you the receptor for sweet, and sweet also have this element, which is the same for umami, and then another second one. Because I'm going to tell you a little later that if you know how to administer umami, you can actually make food sweet without using sugar. But we'll come back to this. So just remind yourself there are two parts, but now we're looking at this particular part. And just a few years ago, we found out how this is working. And it really works like Pac-Man. So uh, <laughs> if you think of Pac-Man now, you would know how how uh, you should understand this. So there are two panels of images here. Um, below I have sort of a Pac-Man analogy. On the top there's an image, or dynamic image, a molecular simulation that describes how this motif that sticks out in the pore, in the taste buds, that is supposed to figure out what, what your foodstuff tastes of. And uh, in the molecular world, Molecules are very small, so they're subject to what we call thermal, thermal motion. So they're constantly doing like this. So the umami receptor sits like this, like the, 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 uh, the Pac-Man. And then if a glutamate molecule comes along, it sticks to Pac-Man's throat. And she, she can't really sort of vibrate that much. So a signal goes to the brain saying there's something bound, it's umami. But the real secret is there's other binding sites on the periphery of this motif, I could call it Pac-Man's lips. This is where the fish would come in, or where the mushroom would come in, and then he shuts up altogether. And this is what you see on the other side, and it's seen in simulation. So this is the secret of the synergy. You need two, two things here. Two, the two, you need two to tango, and um, he really shuts up when both of them are present at the same time. In chemistry, this um, is a quite well-known mechanism. It's called allosteric action or synergetic action. It means that you can enhance an effect by adding a little bit of something else. And I'll come back to that when I tell you how to make a brown gravy because it's really a matter of knowing how to, to add this uh, little bit extra thing. But before I, I do that, let me just show you some pictures. I'm very fascinated with the Japanese cuisine, as you might have guessed and in particular some of these weird ingredients. Um, here is seaweeds. It's grown in, and actually farmed in large amounts in, in waters in Asia, in particular around Japan. This is from the northern island, Hokkaido. And uh, so it's, it's farmed and it's harvested, uh, brought into land, it's dried, and, um, and then it ends up being pieces like this, 
come in many different qualities and different prices, and you can actually call it the price with the amount of glutamate that is in the seaweed. So the more precious seaweeds are those that have higher amounts of glutamate. And uh, it's sort of a cottage industry. There's an old woman here who turns it around and then it's stored uh, usually two years up to, up to 10 years. What about the fish? Bonito is in the family of the mackerel or tuna and it's caught and um, I don't have time to mention it, but I, if some of you want to know more about it, I could tell you about the fishing techniques that I used and also the way you prepare the fish. Because obviously you can imagine, in order to give the largest amount of the nucleotide that's in the fish, you have to prepare it in a special way. And uh, this actually uh, uh, is also reflected in some of your old, old fishing techniques and the way you slaughter the fish. Here it's seen in the market as a beautiful striped fish. And here it's from a little factory where it's boiled. And I said the fish is five times over conserved, salted, dried, uh, cooked, fermented, and smoked. And during this process, the nucleic acids that are tasteless, they're broken down into free nucleotides, which can stick on Pac-Man's lips. So there's a reason why you go through this very elaborate process that is to provide for a maximum amount of this compound. And in the flakes here, which are so thin, um, just a hundred millimeter thickness, 98% of the inosinate, this nucleotide, seeps out in water. So it's a highly optimized cuisine. So here you see the, the fish in the, in the chamber where they're being, they're being fermented by a mold. And here the beautiful samples in in the market. Now I'm going to take you back to Europe and in particular to Nordic waters, but let me just show you one set of data that tells us what dashi is and how it differs from the soup broths which we make in the Western cuisine. So um, you don't have to read the details here, just look at the, at the bars here. This is the amount of uh, different amino acids in different kinds of uh, soup stock. So this is soup stock just made from an extract of the seaweed. And you can see it's very clean. There's only two spikes there. And both of them, this is glutamate and this is aspartate. Those are the two amino acids that gives umami. And then there's hardly anything else. If you add the fish, there's a bit more of other amino acids. It's slightly more complex. But then look at the spectrum of amino acids. For This is a chicken bouillon. And this is a Chinese chicken bouillon, so it's usually with, with meat and with some vegetables. And you can see there are many more different, I mean, it's much more complex spectrum. And um, this is not because our soups, Western soups, don't have umami, but they also have other flavors that are much more complex. And that's probably the reason why it was the Japanese who first come across uh, indication that umami is a basic taste, because they have something in their kitchen it says umami, very clean. They have dashi, just as we have sugar that says sweet. So I'm pretty sure that's why they were discovered in, in Japan. Let's go to Nordic waters, and I can talk to you a little bit about the Nordic cuisine, the new Nordic cuisine. So here's a good friend of mine, Eulfu. He's, uh, he's an Icelandic, uh, and he uh, harvests a Nordic seaweed. In this case, it's called, this is called dulse. It's a red seaweed. And here it is in the, dry, in the dry form. And you can probably see that here there's also some white stuff sitting on this red seaweed. This is actually the flavorful stuff because it turns also out to have umami. This is called dals in Danish Søl. And it was actually a valuable crop to trade in, in Iceland in, in old days. And the more white stuff that was on, the more precious it was. The Icelanders knew that that was much better to provide a good flavor in, in the in the kitchen. So, um, you know, in the, in the new Nordic cuisine, it's a matter of looking for deliciousness in the Nordic environment. And couldn't we look for making, couldn't we look for making um, dashi out of seaweeds from the, from the Nordic terroir? And so now I'm going to tell you a little bit about some work I've been doing with some of the chefs from Nordic Food Lab and, and Noma. And um, we've sort of explored a number of different kinds of seaweed from Nordic waters. And so we started actually first um, a, a cousin 
to this brown seaweed from Japan, what we know as sugar kelp or so sugar tongue, and it turns out not to have much umami. We started a few other ones, and um, then we focused on this red seaweed, the dolls, which the chef said it tastes very delicious, and now as scientists we can go back in the lab just like a kid did 115 years ago and measure it what's in this seaweed, and we found a spectrum like this. Now you've already seen one spectrum, but you can see there are very strong signals in these two amino acids, glutamate and aspartate, that provides for umami. But there are also others, in particular some that give sweetness, but it has a very high umami potential. So it's a seaweed from the Nordic waters, the one seaweed we found that has the highest um, glutamate uh, content, and therefore the, the, the best umami potential. And the chefs were very quickly to use this. And some of, me, some of you may have met some of the people from, from Nordic Food Lab going around with a Christiane bike in Copenhagen and serving seaweed ice cream. Have some of you had it? It's delicious, isn't it? <laughs> and um, this is uh, Lars Williams, uh, the, um, uh, the, um, uh, the, the chief of development of NOMA. And, and, um, we actually wrote a paper together about this and, and, and last developed this recipe for the ice cream. And um, he also used it both for ice cream and fresh cheeses and also bread. And why would you use it in ice cream and why would you use it in fresh cheeses? Well, I, you should know that, or you will know that ice cream and fresh cheese are made from milk. Cow's milk have hardly any umami potential. Unless, well, it has high umami potential if you ferment it but if you just eat it fresh or drink it fresh, there's not much umami. So then you can incubate your, your, um, your milk with, um, with this, with this dolls. And here's, uh, now we, we're here to talk about science and food. And there's a paper here, it's actually a scientific paper. And I've been writing during my career many papers and also in, in very highbrow journals like Nature and PNAS and things like that. This is a sort of a more, remote journal, but it's actually the most interesting paper I've ever been part of. And it's also gotten the largest attention. It's actually a scientific paper with free recipes. We had to fight the editor of the scientific journal, say we want recipes in there. So in this, this paper here, which is in a journal called Flavor, there are actually recipes uh, on these three particular kind of, of dishes. Here's another dish. Um, where you can make something, I would say, completely unedible into something edible. This is, uh, uh, I apologize to the vegetarians, but this is um, uh, the finest um, wheel um, sirloin or filet that is uh, made into a tartare. And because it's, there's hardly any fat in, it doesn't taste, taste much. What it needs is some umami synergy. It actually has some inosinate, so what do you do to provide with umami synergy? You can add some seaweeds. So in this case, my good uh, chef, uh, friend, colleague, uh, Klaus Stürbeck, with whom I actually wrote a book about umami, I'll come back to that, he's adding some of the red dolls there. And this, this is actually sort of inspired by, um, by Carpaccio, which you notice is the finest sort of fine cut wheel. And in um, um, the, the invention of Carpaccio, where you had um, uh, have this, this very fine, sli fine slice of meat, you always put it in an emulsion, a mayonnaise, where there's some Worcestershire sauce in. And Worcestershire sauce has also umami, it has glutamate. So here there's actually an emulsion of, um, uh, with containing Worcestershire sauce, so together it provides uh, good umami. Now, we have the seaweed that can make a Nordic dashi, we can make the extract, we also need some synergy. So what, what do we do to get something to, that, to replace this? You can think of making a mackerel into a fish like this. It's actually not that easy because it's too fatty. Uh, but you can look for other stuff. You can take chicken and actually chicken. In this case, it's dried and salted chicken. It can provide for, for umami synergy. You can also use, of course, mushrooms, and we've done that. Now, let me take you down completely down to the most Fundamental thing, that's the kitchen of using waste. So now I'm going to give you a recipe of using waste in the kitchen, but which has chosen to provide umami. And um, so one is potatoes, potatoes in particular, boiled potatoes, old potatoes that are close to sprouting, 
where the, with the pilon, they release a lot of glutamate in the cooking water. And that's why those who really know how to cook, and all our mothers and grandmothers knew how to do that, they never threw away the water from the potatoes, because that provides for flavor. So if you want to make a brown gravy, you would use the, the, the potato peel. So there you've got glutamate. Now, how do you get some nucleotides that can go into synergy with this? Well, we can use shrimp. In this case, it's actually what is thrown away in restaurants when they peel a little, little fiori, the little shrimp. They throw away the heads. But you can dry the heads, you can smoke the heads, you can grind it up into a powder, and then I would say it is almost as good as the flakes from this fish. So now you can make a dashi out of two waste products from the ladies' kitchen. You take the potato water and add, add the, uh, the powder of the, um, of the shellfish. So now you know why I presented you with this scheme. Uh, in the beginning, these nine different things, they all share underlying most wonderful taste, and that is the fifth taste, that is, that is umami. But in order to um, acknowledge it, in order to, to, to taste it, you have to taste carefully. And I'll read you the last quote from the old paper from 1909, um, where Ikeda speaks to us for 100 years of time. He says, an attentive taster will find something in common in the complicated taste of asparagus, tomatoes, cheese, and meat, which is quite peculiar and cannot be classed under any of the above mentioned qualities, sweet, sour, bitter, and briny. But you have to taste carefully, because quite often the taste is hidden underneath other stronger flavors, like it could be salt, it could be sweet, it could also be bitter. So now I told you uh, the secrets of umami, and um, in, uh, in my book, and there are also some flyers somewhere around in this uh, room, you can take and bring home and put on your refrigerator. Here are a list of things that can help you to get your mommy in the kitchen. And you can also download, down, <coughs> download this as a poster from a web page I'll give to you later. But it's actually just called umamibook.net, umamibook.net, you'll find it there. And the, here are two, um, uh, two uh, uh, panels. And the top one is glutamate, going from something which you probably can't see because it's white. <laughs> this is a glass of milk, uh, which has basically no glutamate, all the way up to the uh, ingredient I found that has the most. And I haven't found anything that has more free glutamate than this brown seaweed. And going from milk to the brown seaweeds, we're going up by a factor of 3,000. And then, uh, in the range between here, you can find a lot of the stuff which you may use in your kitchen. There are both some uh, fresh raw ingredients, but also some that are highly processed. For instance, um, tomato uh, ketchup, I'll come back to that, cured ham. There's miso here, there's soy sauce, uh, there's the salted anchovies, there's the cheeses, there's some fermented products here, um, uh, fish sauce, and something here. I don't know if there are any British here. Are there some Marmite lovers? Hey! And also some mama haters? Okay. So, um, marmite is very, uh, very high in glutamate, and it's made from um, basically yeast, yeast that are dyed. The first marmite was made in the Bass Breweries in, in England, where they collected the, the dead, um, uh, dead um, yeast cells. And when the yeast cells die, the enzymes are released, and they digest the proteins and produce a lot of glutamate. So this is really an umami bomb. So this is glutamate. We also call glutamate the basal umami. That's the one that sits in Pac-Man's throat. Then we have the nucleotides, and they're here bunched together, all three that elicit uh, umami um, from some that has hardly any green asparagus. Green asparagus is very low in free nucleotides, but it's very high in glutamate. And in some cases, you will find some on both axes here. And going to the extreme, I have found nothing that has more free nucleotide than this fish, katsubushi. So either the Japanese have been very lucky, or they've been very insightful. At least they found the two parts that when you bring them together, you can't really get more umami out of anything. Uh, and then you, what, what you find here, which is a lot of umami, uh, gluten-free glutamate, there's uh, anchovy paste. Here there's uh, 
there's, uh, there's pork, there's some shellfish, and, and other, other fish. So pairing is very important. So in, the, in Japanese cuisine, pairing for dashi, seaweed, and this katsubushi. And then I'll bring you back home. So this is the seaweed and katsubushi, or shiitake. But egg and bacon are good pairs. Egg provides glutamate, bacon, inosinate. Cheese and ham, there's a reason why that goes well together. Glutamate and inosinate. Tomato and beef, I mean a sauce bolognese. The tomatoes, <laughs> the beef, <laughs> vegetables and meat, which you combine in a traditional soup. And then uh, you can, of course, once you have this inside, uh, you can go and look in the tables and say, where do I find something which has a lot of glutamate and where do I find something that has a lot of nucleotides? And then I can bring them together and maybe do what some would call molecular gastronomy in the sense that it's inspired by molecular understanding. So this is real molecular gastronomy, whereas pouring glycogenate nitrogen and some ice is not, nothing to do with molecules. So green peas and scallops is an example. So here is the dish, something we constructed here. So you take peas and make a, a, a soup. It could be cold and warm, green peas, have a lot of glutamate. And then you take a shellfish. In this case, it's, um, it's scallops. It's very high in a nucleotide, nucleotide called adenylate, the third one of the three I mentioned. And if you're not content with the glutamate content, you toss in some seaweed. So this is a construction, and it's very flavorful. Now, what about this? Uh, Danes have world record in eating um, mackerel and tomato sauce. We eat 70 million cans a year. <laughs> and there's nothing as smelly. You agree? It's not but it tastes wonderful. And I have, I, I have to admit that after I understood the mechanism of umami, I led myself to admit that I like mackerel and tomato <laughs> sauce. Uh, so um, that's perfect umami bomb. Now, now we have to go in the kitchen and we have to work to get umami because not that many raw ingredients have a lot. And seaweed is an example of one that actually has a lot before processing. But actually, if you go through what we do in the kitchen, cook, simmer, boil, roast, broil, smoke, dry, mature, age, store, conserve, in particular ferment, these processes which we have developed during our cuisine for various reasons, one reason in particular is of course to make things digestible and also make it less tough so we can actually eat. I mean, we are, as a species, I don't know if you're aware of that, we are cooks and no other species that heat treat their food. And we probably started as a species heat treating our food 1.9 million years ago. And the heat treating of the food provided us with a lot of calories, a lot of nutrients, so we could build a big brain, which is characteristic for our species, and keep it running. It uses 30% of our energy, so you need a lot of calories, and of course you need proteins to, 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 to build the body. So the, the, the kitchen, is about transforming ingredients to something that is edible. And I'm talking about evolutionary timescales. I'm not talking about what we do from day to day because we can easily eat raw. But if we as a species just eat raw, we'll die because our, redu our reproductive potential goes down just by a few percent, but that's enough to wipe us out over evolutionary timescales. So all these things we do in the kitchen for, for reasons of necessity actually also provide flavors. And these flavors we've come to like, and some of them we are sort of, um, we are primed by evolutions to crave for. And we all know we crave for sweet. It's nothing, I mean, there's nothing to discuss, we crave for sweet. And there's a reason for that because it's a signal of calories. It's very important over evolutionary timescales. But we also need nutrients. We crave for umami. And umami is a sign because it tells us that the amino acids is a sign of there being proteins. So this is sort of evolutionary signals for us, for food that will sustain us. And um, you, if you look at the composition of mother's milk, you'll find that two characteristic flavors, sweet and umami, <laughs> sweet from lactose and umami from glutamate. So we already, from uh, birth, actually are primed to 
or keep uh, keep your thing up we should actually uh, look out for these flavors so let me finish off showing you some food and um, here's a soup and you know the best soup and again I apologize to the vegetarians but you can translate meat into into fungus if you like uh, a, a good soup you need to really work on the vegetables and you have work on the meat or the bones and the meat and the bones provide an arsenate and the, and the various kind of uh, vegetables we provide for, for the, the glutamate. These dishes that simmer and simmer for a long time, here's a cassoulet and a, and a stofado. You, you, you work on them for a long time, you break down proteins, you break down nucleic acids and what in the bottom of the pot there, that's the most tasty. And this of course from where you make the, the soup. Those of you who remember your history lessons would know that Napoleon fought a big um, war, a battle at uh, Marengo in uh, June 14, 1800. And unfortunately, the, uh, all the kitchen wagons, they were left, there were no French food left. So he sent out his, his chef and his people into an environment in the northern part of Tuscany and to find something where they could cook a meal. So they took whatever they got there, and they're certainly not what they used in the French cuisine, but what did they find? They found, they found egg, they found crayfish, uh, they found tomato sauce, and then uh, there's uh, maybe there's some chicken, of course there's some chicken, and they cooked this together and made a new dish. And it, the story goes that Napoleon, who won, who won the battle, he was so, um, happy winning the battle that he associated the battle winning with also the flavor of this dish. So every time he won the battle after this, he was supposed to be served this dish, which has got the name chicken alla marengo because it was a battle in marengo. And if you look at these ingredients, they're all umami. So this is Italian umami. Some of you may have been to New England and had clam bake, where you make an oven and, and a stone oven on the beach, you fire up, the big stones, they get very hot, you fill the, fill the oven with wet seaweed and then you put in various kinds of shellfish, it could be of course clams, but it could also in this case be a lobster. If you do that on the beach, all the good stuff will just go into the, to the sand, but if you do it in a, in a pot like this, it goes to the bottom of the pot and you get the most delicious sort of a dashi underneath because it's extract of the seaweed and so that's glutamate and extract from from the, from the shellfish that provides for the free nucleotides. And then being in Denmark, we cannot avoid the brown gravy. And uh, I don't know if you can agree with me that there's nothing as terrible as a brown gravy that is not made the correct way. Similarly, there's nothing as heavenly as the correctly prepared brown gravy. And you know, in order to make a brown gravy, you have to cook bones and meat. Again, I apologize to the vegetarians, use use uh, mushrooms, bone and meat and vegetables. And you do it for hours and hours, reduce it, and then you can make your brown gravy. And if you're then disappointed with the flavor, there's still something missing. Um, if you think it's salt, you add salt and it's getting too salty. You think it's sweet, you add sugar, it's getting too sweet. What is missing is umami. And what do you do? You take a little bit of blue cheese, a little bit of okfo, dana blue, as little as you can't, you can't taste it, maybe a little acidity, provides a lot of glutamate. If it's a inositate or nucleotides that are missing, you take just a little bit of an anchovy, so little that your grandmother will never detect that you put an anchovy in the brown gravy. Or you can also, be, of course, use a little bit of, of concentrated uh, tomato, uh, tomato sauce. So that's the brown gravy. Here's, um, uh, various kind of meat cuts we like. They're also aged, contains a lot of, of umami and, and, and the cheeses. Uh, hot cheeses, the long fermented cheeses, they are very rich in, in umami and, and glutamate. Fish sauces, um, which we know in Europe way back from the Roman Empire, we had garum fish sauce, and of course in Asia, uh, various kinds of fish sauces, they're very high in glutamate, so there's a reason why you use fish sauce, just a drop even if you don't like fish, and the smell of fish, uh, fish sauce doesn't smell necessarily very nice, but just a drop, um, it'll, it'll provide a lot of umami. Soy sauce is the Asian uh, fast shot of, of umami, or you can use the paste uh, uh, miso. And to those of you who eat sushi, you may not be aware of it, but actually sushi was 
developed as a way of imparting umami to something that has very little umami. In this case, it, the rice, this is a, a gunkan sushi, which is battleship sushi. Underneath these, these little um, folders there, there's a, there's a lump of, of sushi rice. And sushi rice has no umami unless you've added some, could be kanbu when you cook it. But in order to make the rice edible, you have to add some umami. And here, um, using a seaweed, uh, called, it's called porphyra, which makes nori. And nori actually have both glutamate and inosinate. It's one of the few uh, ingredients that can combine both to make Pac-Man happy. And the chef also knows there how to impart more inosinate, so he or she takes um, 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 fish roll that has a lot of, um, a lot of inosinates. And, in fact, uh, sushi is an interesting place to sort of see how Good chefs can impart umami to something that has very little umami. Uh, and it could be the fish and uh, shellfish, the seaweed. And if you want to adjust it at the end, you know what you're doing, you just add a drop of soy sauce. And then um, the umami is perfect. Tomatoes. Uh, sun dried tomatoes in particular. And um, in the Western cuisine, we have something which you can compare with the uh, soy sauce. On our tables, we have uh, ketchup. And actually, ketchup, you may sort of think ketchup is a terrible thing. Well, modern ketchup is because it's full of sugar. But the old recipe from Heinz from 1876, you can see it says mushrooms, anchovies, tomatoes, and walnuts, all ingredients that provide umami and a lot of umami synergy. So in fact, the old types of ketchup didn't have much sugar. And if you go way back, when ketchup was invented, it was actually a fish sauce, ketchup. Um, so that's the umami bomb. Let's look into the tomato. And um, this is data from a scientific paper. But if you read the names of the people on the, on the paper, you can see there's one name you may recognize. Here, this is Heston Blumenthal. And Heston Blumenthal was sort of one of the um, um, early people in, in molecular gastronomy, he had always sort of wondered about the different taste of the inside of a tomato and the outside of a tomato. And if you measure the amount of compounds that get umami, either glutamate, or in this case, this nucleotide called adenylate, they're four times as much in the inside of the tomato as in the, in, in the outside. So if you really want umami, you should certainly use the inside. And if you want to concentrate the umami, for instance, for using it in, a, in, a, in a, a dessert, what I'm going to tell you now. You take the inside and make a juice out of it, and you could make it very concentrate, concentrated, and then you can add it to a sorbet. And uh, now I'm coming back to the uh, secrets behind the, the umami mechanism. Um, but first, the dish here, so it's a sorbet, and you know you need a certain amount of sugar to make it sweet enough. In this case, uh, my chef friend Klaus Dürbeck has made a sorbet with 30% less sugar, but instead he's adding a little bit of a juice of the inside of a ripe tomato. So little that you really have to taste very carefully to taste the tomato. But what is happening is that the sweet receptor and the umami receptor have some kind of interaction, and we don't know what the details are, but I mentioned to you that the umami receptor consists of two parts. And one is the one that catches like Pac-Man, and the other part, which is not part of the direct identification. But this other part, it shares with another component in the sweet receptor. So that's probably why there's a synergy between sweet and um, umami. So you can enhance sweetness. If you have sweetness in some foodstuff, you can enhance it if you know how to add umami. So you can do with less sugar. Something I don't have time to tell you about is that you can actually also do that with salt. You can sometimes cut salt down by 50% by regulating umami. So that's also good news. So let me just end out with a few uh, things um, uh, which may uh, sort of be examples of how you can use this inside. Here's, here's a, a salad. And I'm prepared to admit to you that I think green salads and lettuce, it's nice and fresh and watery, but it doesn't taste so what do you do in order to make it tasteful? You add umami. So what has this chef done is adding green asparagus, lots of glutamate. There's a bit of bacon here, inosinate. There's, uh, 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 there's um, uh, tomatoes, again, a lot of glutamate. There could be some blue cheese, more glutamate. 
Uh, now this salad is very tasty. And what about this stuff here? Uh, take a pizza. A pizza is stu uh, a study in umami. It's basically just a, a crust of a baked crust of, of flour and, and salt. And on top of that, a lot of umami compounds. You have the tomato paste, glutamate. You have um, Parmesan cheese, more glutamate. You have anchovies, inosinate. You have cured ham, more glutamate. You have um, there's also some capers. There's also some glutamate in the capers. Now it's certainly very wonderful. A pasta. I think pasta is unedible unless you add something. It has interesting texture, mouthfeel. So what do you do? You need a sauce, a sauce bolognese, perfect umami, and a burger, and a modern burger with a dull ball bun that is dry and meat without any fat, not tasty. So what do the burger chef do at uh, ketchup, um, uh, cheese, maybe bacon, it's all providing for umami. So let me finish in Japan where I started and just end up with a few comments on what you can use this for. So I think there's something to learn from those who made dashi, uh, in particular also the, the uh, vegetarian cuisine because it may actually help us to eat more of this. And I don't know, I don't know if, you, if you have it like me, it's difficult to eat 600 grams of green stuff every day. And the reason is it's not tasty enough or the texture is ruined. But one of the secrets you can use to make it tasty actually is to use, use dashi. You can, um, you can um, um, steam it in, in, in uh, these different extracts. So the final thing I'll just mention to you is that there's actually also a perspective that some of us tend to forget because most of us have problems getting too much food and too many calories. Um, but there's actually an interesting thing with um, umami. It provides for appetite, it releases saliva, it also releases uh, immuno immunoglobulin A, which is very important for the immune system. So it provides for good mastication, good digestion, and enzyme productions, it's good for the oral, oral health. And the important thing is that that has been discovered recently, that you not, not only have these taste receptors, glutamate receptors on, in your mouth, you have it throughout the gastrointestinal system. And these report back to the brain when you've had enough. So actually, meals that are rich in umami are also usually not only tasty meals, but they also are meals that provide for society. The trouble is sometimes we don't listen to what the brain says and we keep on eating. But it's an interesting sort of what is called a homeostatic principle that umami both provides for appetite, you like to eat, but it also say when it's enough. And I'm sure all of you have experienced this. You've had, you're eating something and you're not really full. You're eating more, you're not really full. Compared to meals where you eat something, it's very delicious and you don't eat that much before you're actually satisfied. And that is usually because umami is um, is uh, coming into action. So now I've run over time. I'll just flash the food to make you with your appetite. <laughs> and then I'll invite you to, to go and look at the book. I have a, brought a copy up here. It just came out in the US and English a few months ago. I wrote it together with Chef Klaus Strubeck. It's on umami and um, a lot of recipes in the book. It's also in the Danish version, uh, which you can find on the web. And um, I'll also like to uh, point your attention to a whole new Danish initiative on taste, and umami is part of the taste register, of course. Uh, it's a center called Smay for You, or Taste for Life, where we're actually exploring taste, um, also with, with children and young, young people, and trying to get ownership to the taste. And basically what I try to convey to you also tonight, hopefully, is also at least inspire you to regain ownership to your taste and flavors, to so taste carefully and appreciate the food and look for deliciousness. So thank you for your attention.